because it's only two minutes. So let's have a look at this guy for a minute or two. supplements and being fit, but I can never understand what's going on in terms of evidence. There's always conflicting evidence. Should I take vitamin C? Should we take in wheatgrass? So this is a visualization of all the evidence for nutritional supplements. It's, this kind of diagram is called a balloon race. So the higher up the image, the more evidence there is for each supplement. And the bubbles correspond to popularity as regards to Google hits. So you can kind of immediately apprehend the relationship between efficacy and popularity. But you can also, if you grade the evidence, sort of do a worth it line. And so supplements above this line are worth investigating, but only for the conditions listed below. And then supplements below the line are perhaps not worth investigating. Now this image constitutes a huge amount of work. We scraped uh, like 1,000 studies from PubMed, the biomedical database. And we compiled them and graded them all. But what it points to is that Visualizing information like this is a, is a form of, of knowledge compression. It's a way of squeezing an enormous amount of information and understanding into a small space. And once you've curated that day, and once you've cleaned that day, and once it's there, you can do cool stuff like this. So I converted this into an interactive app. So I can now generate this application online, this visualization online. And I can say, yeah, brilliant. So it's, it spawns itself. And then I can say, well, just show me the stuff that affects heart health. So let's filter that out. So heart is filtered out so I can see if I'm curious about that. I think, no, no, I don't want to take any synthetics. I just want to see plants and, and uh, just show me herbs and plants. There we go, all the natural ingredients. Now this app is spawning itself from the data. The data is all stored in a Google Doc and it's literally generating itself from that data. So the data is now alive. This is a living image and I can update it in a second. New evidence comes out. I just change a row on a spreadsheet. Douche, again. This the image re recreates itself. We're collecting and creating all kinds of okay. data about how we're living our lives, and it's enabling us to tell. So, the rest of it is also interesting, but we'll but we'll leave it at that point. You can have a look at that um, yourselves. So, <coughs> did you did you pick up what he said there about? all this information, collecting all this data, and then condensing it down into a small, a small space. Did you pick that up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea. And that's exactly what, you know, the theme of what you're doing is, is the same thing. Yeah, good, you picked pick that up. Okay. So, and there's somebody else to, to, to keep an eye on, and, and I say I suggest, strongly recommend, well, I would hope you follow up all the links that I've put in these slides, but again, there's a, there's a more detailed one of, of his ideas in this video here. Okay, so let's have a look at some other sort of sources of information and, and where the way it's visualized. Mapping crime statistics is very popular because the public want to know about crime. And there is the UK crime statistics data here. And uh, let's have a look at this local one, Derby. <coughs> so let's have a look at this. So this is our area here, it's right in the mid we're in the middle of university. So these are some data that's again bringing a whole lot of data, well, data into a small space so you can make so you can have a look at it and, and view it. So we've got the university in the middle, and we've got some different numbers of crimes here. We can go in a bit further and see what's going on. So these indicate different sorts of crime around, around. Okay. We can go right down into that as well. Let's go back out again. So we're using 
public data and then presenting it in interesting ways for people to use to make their decisions from. Uh, in there. So we've got some, okay, this is, this is the data that's being used down the bottom here. So, okay, within crime within one mile of DE 221 GB, which is where we are now. So we're on August um, ASB, what's that? Um, something behaviour? Antisocial behaviour, that's it. Antisocial behaviour, 62 cases, burglary 17, robbery 2, vehicle theft. Okay. A bit frightening, really, isn't it, when you look at it? I wonder whether these are actually <laughs> causing the opposite effect. <sighs> driving people away. So half a mile of where we are now uh, in August. Um, so. so we can get that kind of data and, and plot it. Again, we're using maps exactly like 200 years ago, you know, uh, using maps to, to show this. Um, let's close that off. And then there's that Illustrates thing that we, that we found last week <coughs> that uh, Miroslav and, and Georgia discovered again really nice use of visualizing data here we had a quick look at that last week um, and then there's the US one as well US crime data again so this is Los Angeles each one of these is an individual crime location Okay, look at that, how it's all concentrated in that area. Um, let's, 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 uh, let's go in a bit, see what we can find, see if, see if we can find anything interesting. Is interesting the right word? I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, I'm not. Okay, so what's this one here? Uh, burglary, okay, burglar at this point. Uh, when was it? Uh, 22nd of October, a couple of weeks ago. Um, entry of structure with intent to commit theft or, 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 or a felony. Okay, what else have we got? Multi vehicle theft here, 20th of October, vehicle stolen. Okay. Burglary here. Oh, I can see now, I, I can see what that means. It's a, it's a, it's a mask. Yeah. For a burglary. Okay, just 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 realised what that what that was about. You mean zoom out? Yeah. Let's close that off. Was it the last? Actually, no, it was wrong. I thought like because there was like so many police stations there. Yeah, well, there's Los Angeles down here, like. Yeah. Um, are these the police stations possibly? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, not necessarily. It might be right actually. Could be a police station. We have to check the um, check the. Uh, I think that's the problem with these things: is that they create a picture which perhaps is unrealistic. You know. I don't know. Maybe. I wonder what's going on with all this up here. It's all it's all grouped in an area, isn't it? Uh, I think it's more oh, yeah. more to the if you zoom yeah. if you scroll up it'll show up more. Let's go in a bit further. Oops. Hmm. Anyway, okay, so you can see we've looked at Modern visualizations and the power of computing to help us do that. We've looked at um, visualization techniques from a couple of hundred years ago, which we're using the same technique, but we're using computer power to do it. Okay, let's have one final, one final word from Rosling, as to say, who's been extremely influential, and we'll give him the last couple of minutes to close things off again with another example of, of his visualization. Um, method again, which has been very influential. Let's 
try again. Come on. I'm running it from course resources, that's why it's asking me for lots of passwords rather than from the website. Years that changed the world. A Gapminder video with Hans Riesling. Let's just uh, let's just get it on the screen in a better place. Okay, we've got one. So, so just a short couple minutes. One of his masterpieces of visualization, if you like. It was the last 200 years that changed the world. I will show you in Gapminder world here the situation 1809. Each bubble is a country. The size show the population and the color show the continent. The brown here is West Europe and you can see from the map for the rest. This axis shows health, life expectancy at birth, from 30 years to 80 years. And this axis shows income per person in dollar adjusted for inflation and for purchasing power. 200 years ago, all countries of the world had a life expectancy less than 40 years and had an income less than $3,000. Now I start the world. And you can see that the countries with good statistics, they are jumping up and down. There were famine years, there were better years. And West Europe and North America in industrialization started to grow the economy. But health didn't get much better. And slowly, slowly health was getting better. And when we came to a situation about 100 years ago, most of the countries of the world had not improved much. It was only this part of the world that was getting richer and eventually healthier and healthier. And between the First and the Second World War, you can see that the difference between the richest and the poorest in the world is just increasing. It was after the Second World War that most of the countries started to change. The green Arab countries here get richer and richer. China here is getting healthier and healthier. Now economic growth starts in China also. And the Arab countries, the green ones, they get healthier. And here we are today. We have a continuous world from high-income countries with long life expectancy to low-income countries with very low life expectancy. But all countries of the world today has more than or are estimated to have more than 40 years of life expectancy. And all does not have more than $3,000 per capita. So it means that the world has become healthier and richer. But the difference still is enormous between the richest country and the poorest country. And there are also very big differences within countries, which we cannot show here. But to show how the change came about in a different way, I would like to compare two countries here. I will go back to, to uh, 200 years ago here. 1809, and I would like to compare the United States with China. Look, 200 years ago, the economy was growing in the United States, whereas it was declining in China, that was dominated by foreign powers. Then health started to improve in the United States, but nothing happened in China. And in fact, it was not until modern China emerged here, 1950, that China really started to improve. That was, of course, the great leap forward. That was what Mao Zedong called it. In fact, it meant a leap downwards. But eventually, China got a better health and then started with a fast economic growth and is catching up with the United States. And today, the world looks like this. 
Some call it a flat world. It's not really flat. But what's meant with that expression is that the middle-income countries here, also called emerging economy, they have now a relatively good health, basic education for all, and some have very good education, are very capable, and they can compete with the high-income country in a completely new way, which we especially see now during the financial downturn. And, and uh, in 2009, the income will fall in most of the high-income countries. It will be a very tough period for the low-income countries. Perhaps those will be worst hit by the financial downturn, whereas the middle-income countries continue to have economic growth, and the gap between the richest and those in the middle, that will probably shrink quite fast during the next three years. Now, you can look at the details of each country's in Gapmind the World on our web page. Okay. So, we've covered quite a lot of interesting stuff there, hopefully um, giving you lots of ideas and motivation to have a look at different things. So we'll just, I'll just spend five minutes getting you started on the, the activities we're going to do and then you can get a break and then we'll regroup later on like we did last week and you can present what your ideas were for, for that. So we'll get you started on this and then we'll have a break and then regroup and do the, uh, do the activities. So, if you'd like to get yourself into where we've got this, looks like you've got Three pairs, three groups here, two, two, and three there. So, Do you want to bring up this um, file here? It's just if you just if you've got your screen in front of you, just click on that, and it'll bring up the um, bring up the. Uh, there's five. The article is um, the five most influential data visualizations of all time. I've already touched on two or three of these in the session just now. What I'd like you to do in your in your groups is to really dig around into that visualization, find out who did it, what the biography is, anything else they did, what the data source they were used, what the quality of the data was, why was the visualization created, what smart insight, if you like, did it provide. Okay, so I think what I'd like you to do, there's, there's three, three teams here, one over here and two here. I'd like you, do you want to choose, choose one to work on? Do you have any particular preferences that you want to go for? One, two, three, four, or five? Do you want any? Have you got that up? Any, any volunteers for, for doing, for picking any ones that have this? Number four. Number four? Yes. Number four. Okay. There we go. You two going to work on that? Okay. Any other preferences for which visualization to explore in detail? Number five. Okay. 
You can choose, as long as it's not number four or five. I'll only choose one. Okay. So, 